I'm Andrea Lipinski. And I'm Keith DeCandido. And the world's not safe yet, because we're still back with the Chronic Rift. First of all, we've managed to expand. We are now on Paragon. If you're watching this on Paragon, of course, you already know this already. However, if you're watching on Manhattan Cable, you can tell your friends who have Paragon, which is northern Manhattan, that we are now on Paragon since October 11th. This will be the third episode, I think, that's on Paragon. Fridays, 4.30, Channel 17. It's the episode that aired the previous week on Manhattan Cable. Check us out. Tell your friends we've expanded, moved onward, and upward. Tonight, we'll be talking about heroes and villains on our roundtable discussion. What makes a hero? What makes a villain? Why people like them and why people don't like them? That will be later on the roundtable discussion. Last week, we discussed the organization known as the Society for Creative Anachronisms. If you would like to learn more about the era they celebrate, the Middle Ages, check out King Arthur Day on Sunday, October 20th at the Central Research Building of the New York Public Library on Fifth Avenue from noon until 4 p.m. Celebrating the Gottsman Hall exhibition, King Arthur, Looking at the Legend, the afternoon will feature festivities for all ages and tastes. Armored knights will reenact steel sword battles. The Celeste Bartos Forum will be transformed into a scriptorium with workshops and demonstrations, and magicians, storytellers, and musicians will provide entertainment. For more information, please call their public relations office at 212-704-8600. And one last thing, with regard to the Society for Creative Anachronism, we would like to apologize for a piece of misinformation that we gave you on last week's episode. They are not responsible for the Renaissance fairs, such as the one held in Sterling Forest. They are organized by completely different people. And now, returning triumphantly from a long sabbatical is The Man in Black with a look at the latest in videos. Greetings, and welcome to another season. I'm The Man in Black, and here's the video review. Good news for the Star Trek Next Generation fans. Paramount is releasing the first three episodes to tape. For those of you who want to pick and choose and don't want to join the special CBS Video Club, this is a gold mine. The tapes will be 1995 for the double episode Encounter at Far Point, while the Naked Now and Code of Honor will be 1495 each. Tapes to be out early in, November, in October. Another item of interest to Next Generation fans, the first hardcover novel, Reunion, is due out late in October. I just finished an advanced copy and I enjoyed it immensely. An unknown assailant is trying to murder an old crewmate of Captain Picard's while heading to the homeworld to be enthroned as that planet's leader. The mystery works well and the Stargazer stories are excellent. Pick this up in hardcover. You'll be glad that you did. For those of you who like amazing stories, a third volume of episodes is coming out. Patrick Swayze in Life on Death Row, Gregory Hines in The Amazing Fallsworth, and Charlie Sheen in No Day at the Beach. It's still a little pricey at $79.95, but it's still worth renting. Coming this November, Scanners 2, with none of the original cast. They are promoting tape sales with a chance to win a CD player. At $92.95, I don't think they'll have too many entries. Appropriately enough for the pre-Christmas season, Silent Night, Deadly Night 5, The Toy Maker, hits the video racks at $89.95. Live is trying to live up to their new name and prove that they still are. Should you need any of the first four, they've been reduced to $14.95 each. They make great stocking stuffers. On a semi-expensive front, Nightmare on the... 13th floor arrives October 17th. This one actually has a cast. James Brolin and Michelle Green of L.A. Law are participating. Must have been a slow summer. Also coming out soon, the class of 1999 with Stacey Keach and Malcolm McDowell. I tell you, it's got to be slow season for somebody. For Thanksgiving, To Die For 2, Son of Darkness, a sequel that's better than its predecessor. Yeah, sure. For this, Michael Prade left Dynasty and Robin of Sherwood. You just know they're getting desperate. Murder by Moonlight, starring Brigitte Nielsen and Julian Sands, late of Warlock, is coming to video, from television, no less. It's coming out at, at 89.95, and it bombed on television. October 23rd, for the ecologically minded. Mark it on your calendars. That's the day Toxic Avenger Part 3 hits the racks. The video company is playing off the Marvel Comics, and I thought Marvel Comics was playing off the video company. Another $90 winner. Just for laughs, Transfers 2, The Return of Jack Death, arrives September 5th at $89.95. A real laugh. For those of you who, budget, who are budgeting, VCI Home Video is releasing 21 horror titles at a very welcome $19.95 to $29.95. Those titles include Gorgo and the Crater Lake Monster, to name just two. Not to be outdone, Fox is releasing the It Came From the Drive-In promotion. These in titles include Attack of the 50-Foot Woman, Day the Earth Stood Still, The Fly, Return of the Fly, Queen of Outer Space, one of Zsa Zsa's favorites, Race with the Devil, House on Haunted Hill, and The Strangler, 
all for just $14.95 each. Last but by no means least, Disney is doing the totally unexpected. They're releasing Fantasia on video. Available November 1st, the table will be out for an extremely limited sales period. So place your advance orders with your video store now. Fantasia will be available in the regular Disney format at $24.95 per tape, and the deluxe edition containing the fully restored video with a special hologram insignia, a bonus tape of Fantasia, the making of a masterpiece, a frame commemorative lithograph, a certificate of authenticity, two compact discs containing the original soundtrack, and a 16-page commemorative booklet, all for $99.95. A laser disc edition for $99.95 will also be out. However, this is being released only through a short, small handful of video distributors, so it may be a little hard to get. Check with your store now so you don't lose out. Next time, I'll have some more of those films that were supposedly in wide release but only made it to video at $89.95. I'm the Man in Black, and until next time, happy viewing. And remember, many of these videos mentioned by Mr. Black can be found at Omega Zone and other area video stores. And now here to gripe about the comics is our own Keith DeCandida. Thank you, Andrea. During the summer, Marvel Comics had got as high as an 80% market share due to the release of X-Force number one and the new adjectiveless X-Men number one. So the smaller comic book companies really have to work hard in order to keep up with all of this large sales that they're having. One of the biggies that they're doing is licensed material, things that are owned by other people that the comic companies will do comic book versions of. This used to be Marvel's bailiwick sort of exclusively, but they were never all that good at it. The only real success they had was with Star Wars and the Micronauts. Two of the biggest licensors right now are Dark Horse and Innovation. Dark Horse is especially big on movie tie-ins. They have, they're repackaging their Aliens vs. Predator series as a graphic novel, and they also have new series based on Aliens, The Terminator, Predator, Star Wars, Indiana Jones, and The Thing from Another World. Innovation, meanwhile, is doing novels. They have or ha will have four Anne Rice books adapted, as well as books by Gene Wolfe, Terry Pratchett, and Piers Anthony. There's their TV adaptations of Lost in Space and Quantum Leap, which I recently reviewed on Comic Art Commentary, and adaptations of the Child's Play movies. The difference between the two is that Dark Horse is using these to, to keep up the other books that they have afloat. Books like Dark Horse Presents, Cheval Noir, Flaming Carrot Comics, Dead Face, The Mask, their new Billy 99, and Nexus, which they just acquired from first. Innovation, on the other hand, seems to be doing only media tie-ins these days. They're not really living up to their name, you know? This week's comic in review is Curse of the Moment, featuring Big Baby by Charles Burns, published by Kitchen Sink Press. Burns is a regular contributor to the Raw anthology. This one was originally uh, Raw one-shot number five and has two differences with the new Kitchen Sink version. The original title was Curse of the Mole, I'm sorry, Big Baby in Curse of the Mole Men, and the Kitchen Sink edition is now in color. Burns has said in interviews that he takes his inspiration from the EC horror titles of the 1950s. The difference is EC creators William Gaines and Al Feldstein had their tongues almost boring a hole through their cheeks. Burns has all the trappings of EC, but not their sense of humor and not their sense of ghoulishness. The story takes place in the 50s. It involves Tony, big baby, who watches shock theater every Friday night and dreams of monsters buried treasure in the hole the neighbors are digging for their pool. Instead, he finds a real green monster who is kidnapping people and hiding them in dungeons under the ground. It is also a tale of domestic violence. The next door neighbor who is digging the pool beats his wife, carries a gun, drinks a lot, and is much more of a monster than the green thing in the pool hole. The book is actually helped by the color. The monster is more demonic looking in green, though it's still not very horrific. And Burns doesn't have very many faces in his repertory, so the color helps you tell the characters apart. It's hard to tell what the point is here. There's not much by way of horror or social commentary. It's there if you look real hard for it, but doesn't really jump out at you. It's not all that gripping. Burns' art is distinctive, but that's not enough on its own. It looks more like an EC now than the raw hardcover did, but just because it looks like an EC, smells like an EC, quacks like an EC, that don't make it an EC. Curse of the Moment is a 32-page one-shot from Kitchen Sink Press, $4.95 in paperback, and is available at comic shops everywhere, well, maybe not everywhere, but in a lot of places, and directly by mail from the publisher. That's it for Comic Art Commentary this week. I just would like to close by wishing two rest in pieces to Carol Kalish, the uh, direct sales manager at Marvel, who died rather suddenly in the beginning of September, and also to Dr. Seuss, who died after a long and fruitful life at the end of September. We'll miss both of them. Back to you, Andrea. Thank you, dear. You're welcome. Quacks like an AC? Don't ask. Just accept it. It's okay. one of my quirks, or one of my quacks. Depends on how you want to look at it. This week's memorable <laughs> moment comes to us from Mr. Alan Mahoney, who writes, Dear members of the round table. Ooh, I like that. Yeah, Much we're better sounding, than Rifties. Yeah, we're sounding more and more officious all the time. Yeah, I know. Coolness. Anyway, dear members of the round table, 
In regard to your memorable moments, I would like to nominate the conclusion of the film Aliens. The moment when Ripley cautions the mother of all aliens to leave Newt alone, I think the line is something like, get away from her, you bitch. That is what the line is. I can't remember a more satisfying scene in another recent science fiction film or show, unless, of course, one considers the departure of Wesley Crusher from Next Generation. Oh, bitter, bitter. <laughs> So what's he get, Keith? What he gets? Well, the first thing he gets is Joe Clayton's Shadow Play. The second book he gets is the sequel, Joe Clayton's Shadow Spear. And the third book he gets is its sequel, which is Shadow Kill. Those are the three books he gets. They are the Shadow Books. And remember, if you have a memorable moment, write to us here at The Rift. from her, you bitch! Nathan Grendel, God and Lucifer, Othello and Iago, Holmes and Moriarty, the Doctor and the Master. Fiction has always thrived on conflict, and humanity has always thrived on opposites. So the prevalence of the hero and villain in our fiction isn't really too surprising. But who's the good guy and who's the bad guy isn't always that obvious. With me and Andrea to discuss what makes a hero and what makes a villain and why they keep pissing each other off are, over on the far side, Chris Claremont, who was until recently writer of Marvel Comics X-Men and comic, as well as other comics and science fiction novels such as First Flight and the recently released Grounded. Over on my left is Joe Nazaro, a nonfiction writer, interview and fanzine publisher in FNSF and the visual media. He was last on when we talked about Blake Seven. And remotely from her New England home is Ellen Kushner, author of the fantasy novel Swords Point and Thomas the Rhymer. You there, Ellen? Hi. Hello. Okay. <laughs> is my little picture up box? in the corner of the screen? No, not exactly. No. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, um, recently I read an article. It was about the decline of America's moral fiber and how this whole country is going to hell. And one of the things it pointed out was that the four Oscar winners last year were the roles that they played were a con artist, two psychopaths, and Klaus von Bülow. Um, what does this say about the perception of heroes and villains, the fact that we tend to come back to these really nasty characters like that? They're, they're much more fun for an actor to play. I mean, <laughs> from a purely theatrical standpoint, every, you, you make your reputation playing Iago, not necessarily Othello, Richard III, not necessarily, say, the Duke of Buckingham, uh, Darth Vader, not Luke Skywalker, uh, partly because the villain in most dramatic fiction is the active character. He's the one who go, he or she is, are the ones who go out and do things. Snow White was a sweet, innocent little princess. It was the queen who went out, poisoned the apple, went out to the, to the, to, you know, sent the um, woodsman out to kill her, uh, and did all that, you know. I mean, the queen had the, the costumes, the queen had the look, the queen had the, had the action, which is who's the most beautiful one of all. So Snow White was sort of the reactive, innocent party. <laughs> It's like the old cliche where they say the, the villain always gets the best lines. <laughs> he might not get as many, but he usually gets the best ones. I mean, if you want, a, if you want a case in point, just look at Robin Hood, mm -hmm. Prince of Thieves. I mean, right? Who, who is everybody giving a good? Out to be, um, you know, the Sh Alan Rickman Sheriff of Nottingham. Right. <laughs> also starring Kevin Costner. Right. <laughs> and they actually had to tone Rickman's part down because he was getting such raves in it, and they had to try to get Costner's built up a little bit. Nobody cared about the hero. Right. Speak. Well, yep. The truth is that villains always get style. Villains have style to mm -hmm. make up for their lack of moral content. <laughs> right. And style plays well. Speaking of fairy tales, you, um, Ellen, you recently retold um, a new version of Thomas the Rhymer, and it, there's sort of an interesting question there about whether, like, the fairy queen is really a villain there. Is Thomas really a hero? How did you um, 
What was your approach to that, to the hero-villain aspect of, of the book? Well, there is no cosmic struggle in the legend of Thomas the Rhymer um, and in the ballad. And I suppose if I'd wanted to be kind of juvenile, I could have created one. But that, to me, is, is not, that's not my subject when I write. I have one book, Swords Point, which is composed entirely of villains. Everybody in it is a villain. And um, in Thomas, people tend to be more good than not. But um, mostly what really is of interest to me is the way that people interact with each other. And even though the Queen of Elfland is, is an immortal being and, and a sort of amoral being, um, Thomas has his own choices to make. She's not trying to get him to do anything particularly bad. Uh, so I don't feel that that plot was particularly a setup for a, a hero or a villain struggle. <laughs> Did you? Not, well, no, not as such, but it's sort of, it's one of the interesting things about the story is that you wonder, like, who is, who is really the good guy? Did the Queen of Fairy do what she did because she was a nasty person or because it was what she, what she was supposed to do? Because it was her yeah. nature. Yeah. Well, but also you have to th I think that when you cast things in an absolute black or white hero-villain context, you're ignoring a lot of the thrust of good fiction, which is <laughs> to which is essentially this I mean you're getting you partly you get bogged down in semantics because what you're really looking at is protagonist antagonist mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily that one is wholly good one is wholly evil one is wholly the hero one is wholly the villain I mean you may have a heroic central character because that's a necessity of the story but that doesn't necessarily mean that the antagonistic forces or characters are ipso facto villains because in, in the classic sense of the word they may not be evil, they may not have have goals that are particularly antisocial, it's just that they are in opposition to, hopefully, to your viewpoint, to your central character. Uh, and I think the hallmark of a good, of a good book, of a good work of dramatic fiction, is that there are depths and levels to these characters where you can look at them and identify with both sides of the of the table, so to speak, but also that you can see shadings of one and the other. Is, is that why you think that a character like like um, an antihero are are sort of more popular because they have more depth to them? Well, no, I think partly in the antihero sense is that there's a superficial depth because you you know he's sort of like the good guy, but he has all the it's a good guy with bad guy style. <laughs> but what I'm thinking is when you take someone, say, like Macbeth, right. or, or just Hamlet, where you start idea. out yeah. with, with a character who on, or even if you go back further, Oedipus, where you start out with a character who is heroic in every sense, and yet suddenly, in the, almost inexorably through the course of the play, turns into a villain, his own villain in a sense, and is destroyed by it. It's, it's to demonstrate that there are the potentials of, for that in all of us, I think. And, and it's, a, it's a far more complex and eloquent statement than, than simply just saying there's a hero and there's a villain. I think it goes back to what you were saying before about having style. I mean, going back to what we were talking about movies before, it wasn't that long ago that, that everybody was talking about the big character in the movies being uh, Hannibal Lecter, as played by Anthony mm -hmm. Hopkins. So here we have um, a character who is the, you know, the epitome of evil, but he had so much class. He had style. You know, he 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 just had you know, such such panache. He had admirable qualities underneath, and you don't see until much later in the movie where the real evil gets unleashed. Because really, for the the first couple of scenes that you see him, you're sitting back saying, "This is a pretty classy guy," yeah. and and yet it's it's just as as Chris says, you know, if you have the style. That that really makes a big difference, and it's even more effective in the book, where mm -hmm. you don't have all of the the visual trappings yeah. of 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 the the set and the actor playing the role to to sort of give to give you identifiable benchmarks that you can latch onto and say, oh, I like Anthony Hopkins, therefore mm -hmm. I have an automatic. This is one of the best affection. parts he's ever played. <laughs> yeah, right. Also, um, sometimes whether the person is a hero or whether the person is a villain depends on the situation. Somebody who was directing a play of Macbeth once told me that Macbeth doesn't really change as the play goes on. The problem is his situation changes. At the beginning of the play, there's a war on. Mm -hmm. When there's a war on, he's in his element because he is basically a warrior. You know, and they, all, they, they go through this whole thing at the beginning of what a great warrior he is. When, when peace comes as the play goes on, he doesn't know what to do in terms of peace. This isn't something he knows anything about. 
Hmm. So he doesn't really change so much, but um, the situation around him changes. I think a lot of fiction is about transformation mm -hmm. of one kind or another. Certainly a lot of fantasy it, uh, is about transformation. And if you start a story knowing who's good and who's bad, you just want to watch them play themselves out. It becomes a little formulaic, like a, uh, like a romance or something, where you basically know, or even a Shakespearean comedy, you know who's who, you know what's what, and you know what's going to happen at the end. Um, but as uh, somebody was saying before, it gets more complex when you watch people change from mm -hmm. villain to hero, from hero to villain, what have you. And I, certainly in, in my books, when I thought, it, now that you've brought it up, what really happens is that the heroes are only heroes at the end of the story, and the whole book is about watching them learn how to be heroes mm -hmm. without knowing it, without doing it on purpose. The thing I think of also is what you did in the X-Men with Magneto's character, how he, I mean, he started out when the book first started as the bad guy, and eventually he, it got to the point where he was leading the school. Well, but it's, it's basically a matter of yeah. treating a character as a character, no matter how two-dimensional, in this case, I was presented with him, it's asking, well, why, what kind of, what, what does he want? What is there, his desires as a character? Mm -hmm. And then how could he have gotten to this position? Where did he come from that led him to this decision? What kind of man is he? What kind of form, elements in life formed him, shaped him? And then once you build that aspect of it, if he is this kind of person, how can he do these sort of things? And either he can or he can't. And each question leads you one more step down the road to building a, a three-dimensional character, and out of that, ca or a more three-dimensional character, given the limitations of comics. But then after that, the character that you have built allows you far more depth and, and flexibility in the stories that you can tell about him. I mean, when, when you have someone who is just, I am the villain, I will do be evil things mm -hmm. because it's there, who cares? I mean, it, it becomes an exercise in, so, in technique. You do it. Whereas wh if you have a, a character that, for whatever reason, m is forced by uh, character itself or circumstance to do what could be perceived as evil things, then you have the opportunity for depth and, and three-dimensionality and, and a way of, of reaching out to the audience and taking their, their sympathies and delivering them into the wrong camp, in yeah. a sense. Where you think, where you automatically figure, I, Prince Valiant is the hero, therefore I will love him. Mm. Yeah. Uh, instead, but but Sir Brack is a cool guy. <laughs> Much more fun. <laughs> what, yeah. But then you, you take the next step, which is why is Sir Brack doing the things that he's doing? This is going back to the movie Prince Valiant. Right. You know what? I mean, in the Thief of Baghdad, the old Sabu Thief of Baghdad, mm -hmm. Conrad Veidt is evil. You know it. He he reeks it from every <laughs> pore, and yet everything he does in this in the movie, all the evil acts that he commits are out of this hopeless, unrequited love for the princess, which is a noble thing, yeah. which, which the same love inspires the prince to do, John Justin, to do all sorts of heroic acts. It's just that, that it's, it, you're looking at flip sides of the same coin, and, and you find, at least I find myself looking at this character and thinking, gee, he almost, you know, he deserved somewhat better than he got. It's interesting you mentioned that movie because you have the end scene um, where the thief gets on a flying carpet and he says, I don't want to go for that school or any of that. I'm going to go out and have some fun, <laughs> meaning, you know, I'm going to go out and raise some hell. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a fun character. And this is the same character who could justify um, thievery mm -hmm. because he was doing it for the greater good. He was doing it to save his friends. So here you have somebody, you know, there's, there's an awful lot of gray area. A little more amoral. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the two heroes, the, the prince and the princess, are, are stiffs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Total stiff. You wait for, for the other two characters to come out. Those are the ones that are the most interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I found, when, when Keith, when you brought up the X-Men, I thought you were going to, to mention um, Wolverine, which I think mm -hmm. was a more interesting success uh, story as far as Chris is concerned, because over a several-year period, he had to work with a character um, who was essentially brought in as a homicidal maniac and quickly became one of the most popular characters in the book. And I think that that was really due to your bringing out different dimensions in him over a fairly long period of time. Well, there was a lot more to him. It's than asking that. who he is, and how did he get there? Mm -hmm. And and each question, each answer led you to a a, a new question, which led you to a new story. Mm -hmm. But that's that's the art of writing. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have to we have to wrap it up. Unfortunately, this one zipped right by. <laughs> um, thank you all for coming on, Ellen. Thank you for being on. I'm sitting there on the phone. Oh, it's a pleasure. And. Um, 
Don't forget our contest. Please write in for our contest. We have all kinds of prizes we are giving out in our contest. We are giving away, besides what we mentioned before, there will actually be two Worlds of Wonder videotapes. We're giving away Les Daniels' uh, retrospective look at Marvel Comics history. We'll be giving away the expanded version of Robert Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land. All sorts of prizes. The address will be at the end of the credits. Please write in. Even if you don't want to be in the contest, write in. Say, I don't want to be in the contest, but write in anyway. Let us know. Can we enter? No. It sounds like fun. Yeah, I got There's my so entry right stuff. here. Yeah. 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 What, what contest? <laughs> our contest. It's our grab bag contest. What are we doing next week? Next week we're going to be discussing vampires. Mm -hmm. It's our Halloween episode. We'll see you then. Good night. Good night. This episode was sponsored in part by Comics Interview, the magazine where both the fans and the pros turn to see who's who and how it's done. Read Comics Interview number 100 and see who the 100 most powerful people in the comics industry are. For a free catalog, write to Comics Interview, 234 Fifth Avenue, Suite 301, New York, New York, 10001. Omega Zone, a store specializing in comic books and video movie rentals, including science fiction, horror, animation, and cult films you won't find at your local video store. Now at a new location, 258 West 15th Street, between 7th and 8th Avenues, in Manhattan. Telephone, 212-645-6941. The Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction, a monthly magazine featuring the best in short fiction, plus columns by Aldous Burgess, Orson Scott Card, Harlan Ellison, and Kathy Mayo. For subscription information, write to the Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction, Box 56, Cornwall, Connecticut, 06753. Aboriginal Science Fiction, the monthly magazine of science fiction and non-fiction. Pick one up at your local specialty shop, or write to Aboriginal Science Fiction at P.O. Box 2449, Woburn, Massachusetts, 01888, for subscription information. Heroes and Villains from Bane in January 1992. Crygender, the 21st century's most famous hermaphrodite, is murdered. Public service or a personal quest for vengeance. Organ leggings, terrorism, and global warming in a witch's brew of high-tech mystery and excitement. Crygender by Thomas T. Thomas. Rune, the greatest bard her world will ever know but only if she can overcome the barriers placed against the child of a mere tavern wrench and a woman. Bardic Voices, The Lark and the Wren, a new high fantasy by Mercedes Lackey. Crygender and Bardic Voices, only from Bane Books.